Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third and final day of Africa, Israel, and their descendants, presented by the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm your host once again, Maria Washington, and I'll be facilitating tonight's conversation as well. Part three of our discussion, combating the anti-Zionist black exploitation and how we move forward, will be led by MC founder Dumasani Washington. In case you haven't been able to join us the previous two nights, this is of course a regular Zoom session in which you will be able to interact with the speaker. So during the Q&A portion, you will be able to either type your question in the chat or use the reaction function to raise your hand and ask verbally. Of course, we ask that you all mute your microphones until we've come to the Q&A following the lecture. We are also live streaming to our Ipsy Facebook page, so the recording from tonight's discussion can be found there as well as from the previous two nights. Again, welcome to day three of Africa, Israel, and their descendants. Daddy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Maria, and thank you everyone for being with us on tonight. Um, I, like many of you, have enjoyed uh, watching and, and taking all in from the executive director of IBSI, my son, Joshua Washington, of course, my daughter-in-law, it's something of a family affair, um, shared on last night. I wasn't able to be with you live. I had other duties and responsibilities, but I did see her uh, message, Olga's uh, message on later on, every this morning. It's just, just powerful. And, and yeah, of course, I'm a little biased. Uh, but I was just very uh, blessed and pleased. And so again, so glad that you all are here. If you're here all three nights, thank you so much for joining us each time. We know that your time is valuable. And so we're so glad that you're here. I'm here in several capacities. Uh, I am uh, the president of the board of Ipsy, uh, but no longer the boots on the ground, if you will. My son, it's been about a year and a half or so that he's been the executive director. I started this organization in 2013. He has been a part of it since the beginning, uh, but he is now kind of manning the ship. And again, we are uh, enjoying him. There's much work to be done. So again, thank you for coming. We're going to dive in. I want to, before we begin, we have so much to cover here, and I do want to take your questions as well. Uh, this is the third part of this discussion, but I want to say this here. Um, again, first of all, again, thank you for coming and also thank all of our, um, our sponsors, or I should say all of our um, promotional partners, I'm sorry, I couldn't get the word there, who have been helping us publicize this event. Thank you all so much. I've had a relationship for years now and it's been a great uh, time either working with them, uh, doing events with them both in the past and, and Joshua has been working with them as well. So thank you so much for coming. I want to also say before we get started, as we get started, make this official disclaimer. If we're gonna have a good time on tonight, we're gonna to have to deal with a lot of different things, but I wanna say this, I uh, have the honor and the privilege of serving in different capacities with different organizations, but the views that are expressed here, both here in this uh, lecture and also in my book, Zionism in the Black Church, which we'll touch on in a moment, do not necessarily, they are, they reflect myself, obviously, and Ipsy, but do not necessarily reflect the organ organizations with which I'm affiliated, which is Christians United for Israel, the Congregation of Zion in Stockton, California, the Zion Academy of Music in Stockton, California, and the Hebrew Project Artists, which is a performance group. I just wanted to make sure that this is all on record here. Again, I'm honored to serve in each of those capacities, very beyond honored uh, with some amazing people, uh, but this, uh, event on tonight uh, is strictly Ipsy, uh, and, and the views expressed are from the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel and myself. So that having been said, part three, part one, we dealt with Zionism in the Black Civil Rights Movement. Last night, uh, we dealt with Israel and Africa, the ancient relationship, and tonight, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, such a loaded uh, um, topic, I can tell you this, um, it's sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but always emotional for me. Uh, and this goes, my connection in, in whether it's uh, Israel study, black and Jewish uh, studies, uh, and I don't mean formally, am I formally, I'm a musician by, by, uh, by profession, I actually graduated from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, have been a pastor, uh, honored to serve as a pastor for the past 16 plus years. Uh, but this, this uh, topic of Israel, this topic of the black and Jewish communities and this particular one here that we'll talk about tonight, both the struggle and how we move forward on tonight, combating the anti-Zionist black exploitation and how we move forward. 
So this is also uh, an opportunity for me to tell you that in this um, message here, uh, virtually everything I'm gonna share with you is in somehow an excerpt from the book, not just a, a shameless plug of the book. Do I, I want you to buy the book, yes, but I, I want you to because of what's in it. I don't claim that I have all the answers or anything, but this is something, uh, this whole issue, Zionism, the black church, Zionism, the black community, Israel, the African-American community, these things have been uh, 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 passions of mine for a couple of decades now. And I just felt to put them in a book. It's actually the second edition of the book. The first one was written seven years ago, 2014. So you'll see some excerpts as we walk here to this together. There are six chapters and we only have three hours tonight. No, I'm just joking. Um, we have in our time here tonight, I'm going to focus on the last two, just excerpts from the last two. As you can see there, chapter one, African biblical tie to Israel, chapter two, the Jewish diaspora and prophetic return to Israel, chapter three, Zionism and the historic black struggle for justice, chapter four is dedicated to the pro-Israel legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, chapter five, anti-Zionism, hatred for Israel, and then chapter six, what we must do now. So our focus tonight, ladies and gentlemen, will be uh, these two, a, a, a segment of these two, as we talk about combating the anti Zionist black exploitation. Some of you, uh, my age and older, you know that term black exploitation was coined back in the 1970s when there were a series of films that were made. Uh, they were called that as a positive and a negative, right? It was both this thing in which there were more and more black actors having the opportunity to uh, be in films, but the films at the same time were often certain themes. You know, they were pimps, they were, uh, they were prostitutes that oftentimes a lot of typecasting in those roles. And so the term black exploitation was coined back then to mean both exploiting black talent in terms of putting it on the screen, but also the exploitation of the black community. And this is something that has been a historic issue with the black community when it comes to media. And I use that term for this topic on today. Chapter five, I'm gonna just do a segment of here, anti-Zionism and hatred for Israel. Quote, after Israel's victory in the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the Arab states with continued financial support from the Soviet Union changed their strategy. With the Arabs, what the Arabs could not accomplish on the battlefield, they attempted in the arena of ideas. They decided to use the language of civil rights, freedom and justice, lifted straight out of the black quote handbook and called themselves the oppressed. The Arab Palestinians became the new disenfranchised people of color. The strategy systematically targeted black leaders, distorting the meaning of justice. This had the most significant impact on Africans and black Americans. The Arab League and the Soviet Union began an international campaign of delegitimization of Israel and sought to pass a United Nations resolution, which was 3379, condemning the very ideology of Jewish sovereignty, Zionism. And some of you may know that resolution was called Zionism is racism long before we get to the 2005 uh, Durban conference in which uh, Israel is called an apartheid state a couple of decades before then several uh, 40 years before then we're actually seeing a systematic delegit delegitimization of Israel on an international level and it's the exploitation of the black struggle for justice this time South Africa that's being used to demonize Israel. It was that resolution that actually caused the black civil rights community to galvanize around supporting Israel. And it was Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph, I believe my son referred to them in his presentation two nights ago, who actually spearheaded an organization called BASIC, Black Americans to Support Israel Committee. Again, this was in 1975. You see that picture on the left. The pictures that are circled, of course, are A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin. In the middle there to the two hour right, uh, A. Philip Randolph's left would be uh, uh, Representative John Lewis, who just passed away not too long ago, just a few months ago. Coretta Scott King, Dr. King. This was at the March on Washington is a photo there. Again, that was in 1963. Dr. King, we know, was one of the most staunchest supporters of Israel, probably the most iconic supporters of Israel in the Black American community and throughout, throughout the 20th, uh, for the 20th century. 
his colleagues, now that he was assassinated in 1968, Israel is still being even more so demonized in the black uh, civil rights community, the establishment of them, those that were uh, the lions with Dr. King stood with Israel and the Jewish people. And this is a quote from one of the many articles that Bayard Rustin wrote during that time by embracing the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization or Yasser Arafat, we have given a solemn amen to, or, to organize brutality, encouraging along the way, no one knows how many extremist organizations with a grudge against society. Uh, Bayard Rustin, ladies and gentlemen, and those with him, with BASIC, set a standard for Israel advocacy that was not just for the black community, but for the world. It was a, what I call a, a, a dual approach, defending Israel as the only viable democracy in the Middle East, and at the same time, calling out the abuse of the Arab Palestinian people by their own leaders. This was a uh, the most effective way because it was truth. It was telling the truth about Israel, but also telling the truth about those who were demonizing Israel. They were doing this and at the same time, defending the black legacy, the struggle for justice, because they recognize that if Israel is called an apartheid state or Israel is called a racist regime, then the words have no meaning. I'll say this one last thing, that when he said that there'll be no matter, we have no idea how many other extremist organizations, I mentioned this in the book, ladies and gentlemen, this is another what I call in the black church tradition, prophetic call. Bayard Rustin let the world know that if the international community turned a blind eye to terrorism being exacted on the Israeli civilian population in particular, we were going to have that style of terrorism everywhere. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who know, uh, remember 1975, there was not such term as a global terrorism. Oh, there were bad things and terrorist things that would happen in other places. But now what we are dealing with virtually every nation is dealing with some form of, or needing some form of counterterrorism. Isn't it ironic that the nation that is most adept at helping other nations live peacefully and securely is Israel because of its expertise in defending itself against the terrorism that Black Americans warned would be visited on everyone if we ignored the PLO. Another quote from chapter five, arguably the most effective form of Soviet anti-Zionist anti -Zionist deception and propaganda targeting the black community was embodied by the Egyptian born self-proclaimed leader of the Arab Palestinian people. His name was Mohammed Yasser Abdel Rahman Abdel Raouf Arafat al Quda al Husseini, al Husseini, better known as Yasser Arafat leader of the Palestine Liberation Organization. Yes, Egyptian born, attended Cairo University. Uh, and there in the book, we talk about his circuitous route and becoming the leader of what he eventually called the Palestinian people. Uh, some of you may ought to be aware that that word Palestinian was not used to refer to the Arabs of the region at the time. I'm not saying that there's not a Palestinian people now. I'm saying that term was not used. Yasser Arafat is one of the ones who weaponized that term. And in so doing, ladies and gentlemen, did very much uh, manipulate even the Arabs in the region, placing them in a, a completely impossible situation while he used them to war against Israel. With carefully crafted words and a media campaign of deception, Arafat and the PLO boldly exploited black leaders lack of knowledge about the Arab-Israeli conflict. He received rock star treatment in the press donning the cover of magazines like Time and Life. The Palestine Liberation Organization responsible for countless deaths of Israeli civilian men, women, and children was presented to the world as resistance fighters. This picture here is of Yasser Arafat and Eldridge Cleaver and other members of the Black Panthers in 1969. We believe it was taken in Algeria where Eldridge Cleaver had spoken at an event there. And it's actually, I talk about this in my book. Why is this picture of a black, of, of black exploitation? It is a terrorist who is joining forces with those who are fighting for justice 
in the United States. And without getting into a whole uh, debate about the Black Panthers, let me simply say this, regardless to one's view or even understanding of the Black Panthers, with them being a Black American organization now being connected to a person who's calling himself an Arab Palestinian leader and what's supposed to look like solidarity, and we're gonna go further on this theme, what's going on in the Middle East during this time, regardless of your view of the Arab-Israeli conflict, has nothing to do in a oppressive sense against Black Americans. I'll show you what I mean. That's one picture. I do want to say here, take a little pause and let you know that Eldridge Cleaver was an anti-Zionist turned Zionist. 1969, one of his quotes during that time was, Zionists, wherever they may be, are our enemies. We totally support the armed struggle of the Palestinian people against the watchdogs of imperialism. Well, several years later, about seven years later, after living in extremist regimes, first fleeing the United States and living in Cuba, in which he was poorly by Fidel Castro in the regime there, then he fled to Algeria, where he saw firsthand the Arab enslavement of Africans. I know that my daughter mentioned this on yesterday. She gave a shout out to our friend Charles Jacobs who's doing amazing work with his organization here. Let me say here clearly, when Ipsy, and I'm representing Ipsy, and when I, I'm saying this as in terms of my book as well, pointing out the historic Arab enslavement of Africans is not in any way an attack on our Arab brothers and sisters, right? This is not what this is, any more than when we're talk, pointing out white racism that we are attacking our white brothers and sisters. We are actually attacking the mentality, the ideology, and that system that is oppressing other people. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, all too often in the context of not wanting to offend, sometimes we go so far around that we don't speak the truth. I mean, one rabbi said not too long ago, how can you defend Israel if you don't tell the truth, right? How can you actually do the work of any type of advocacy if you don't at least acknowledge, acknowledge the truth? His quote seven years later, after he had that experience, Elder Cleaver said, to condemn the Jewish survival doctrine of Zionism as racism is a travesty upon the truth. Jews have done more than any other people in history to expose and condemn racism. Elder Cleaver returned to the United States a Zionist. He returned to the United States after being in Cuba and after being in Algeria and seeing the Arab enslavement of Africans. And he came and he tried to his best tell his cohorts, tell his, his former colleagues that yes, in our struggle for justice, we, many of us have been condemning Israel and the Jewish people and we are wrong, you all, we have been exploited. This picture is also not an attack on Jesse Jackson. This was in 1979 and I mentioned this in my book, Jesse Jackson, traveled to uh, Judea and Samaria or, or the Palestinian Authority to try to broker peace between Arabs and the Israelis. And Yasser Arafat um, took this as another opportunity as a photo op with another black leader. This is the part of the presentation, ladies and gentlemen, that is probably the most difficult for me. And I'll tell you why. Probably everyone on this Zoom, on this session, watching this on Facebook, aware of what happened to George Floyd there in Minneapolis in 2020. This picture is a rendering by the Palestinian, uh, Palestine Museum of the United States. And this was shortly after. Ladies and gentlemen, this is not just propaganda and lies. This is what a term I began to use a little while ago, my son wrote an article about it and it was picked up and it went somewhat viral in Times of Israel, the, the appropriation of black pain. See, regardless to what you may know or a, about a George Floyd, about that whole issue, about how he was killed, how he was pinned on the ground for those minutes, regardless to what you may or may not know about all the details, this picture and these renderings represent the exploitation of someone's pain. And when I am saying, I'm speaking in measured tones here because I wanna make sure I'm very, very clear with you. 
I want to make sure that I'm very clear with what I'm attempting to relay. And I talk about this in the book. I showed you the pictures from the 60s and the 70s and then this to show you that this is nothing new. Israel anti-Zionists using the Black community as props for their hatred for Israel is nothing short of, of abhorrent. It is not only not, not concerned, it is a total lack of concern for the people, whether they're Black Americans or the Arab Palestinians. These are lies. The picture to the right is what's been called the uh, uh, um, the uh, lethal exchange or the deadly exchange, somehow blaming Israel for the deaths of African Americans at the hands of law enforcement. Again, this is nothing new, but it took on a whole nother level here just this past year. This was one of the ways, ladies and gentlemen, in the 60s and 70s, the black community was drawn into the Arab-Israeli conflict that even if they were gonna keep a distance, our community kept getting put, the young people say it like this, you keep putting your name in my mouth. They kept referencing and, and trying to use the black community, forcing those leaders particularly to speak. I'm just pausing and going to this next thing. I wanna say here, this was a, a visual reminder to me to say to you, that when I'm talking about the pain, I'm not talking about pain in the sense of, of, of people being helpless, right? This is not a, a one in, in which people are unable, uh, they don't have power. I'm talking about the, the anger and the frustration with uh, the, the tragedies in a community being used in a way to attack someone else, to denigrate someone else. It is again, reprehensible. Chapter five continued, since the terrorist attacks in America on September 11, 2001, Israel, the world's leading expert in counterterrorism, has helped train police from all over the world. Anti-Zionists cite this fact to blame Israel when a US police officer shoots or otherwise harms and kills a black man. Israel has not trained police to racially profile or use excessive force. Those are decisions made by individual officers or the policies of a racist police department. Ignoring this fact, anti-Zionists launched a nationwide campaign for US police to end their relationship with Israel. In 2016, Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed told of his encounter with one of these groups and its anti-Israel crusade. I wanna pause here and say their groups are not in parentheses in the book, they are named. I am not naming specific groups here tonight. Now, out of fear of calling them, I, I don't want to in any way pigeonhole this discussion. I could name certain groups that are responsible for exploiting the black community for hating Israel while pretending to be concerned about the black community. The reason why I'm not, and there's multiple ones, some of you may be thinking about a prominent one, but there's more than one, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you, and they have existed or they have come out in some iteration since again, the late 1960s, but especially after the 1973 Yom Kippur War, this is how it was unfolded within the black community, I'm not calling out specifically because I want to emphasize the principle more than the actual organization. In this teaching moment, I want to, to be able to identify what those principles are. So regardless to whatever the name of the organization is, when it confuses fighting for the black community with delegitimizing Israel, we want people to be able to see that for what it is. Kasim Reed said, there was a former mayor of Atlanta, there was a demand that I stop allowing the Atlanta Police Department to train with the Israeli Police Department. I'm not going to do that. I happen to believe that the Israeli Police Department has some of the best counterism techniques in the world, and it benefits our police department from that long standing relationship. Again, Black leaders standing up to the anti-Israel hatred and Kasim Reed defending his, both his, the police department and his city that it be kept safe, recognizing that its training with Israel was not only not racist, it was actually doing great good to the people of Atlanta, continuing on the same uh, defense of uh, standing against the Israel hatred and not bowing down to this pressure. Today, anti-Semitism and Anti-Zionism within the Black community has a very loud and increasingly influential voice in Minister Louis Farrakhan, leader of the Nation of Islam since 1978. 
Farrakhan's mentor was Elijah Muhammad, Nation of Islam leader from 1934 to 1975, although it wasn't called the Nation of Islam, it was called simply the Black Muslims. According to Anti-Defamation League CEO Jonathan Greenblatt, Louis Farrakhan is, quote, quite possibly the most popular anti-Semite in America. The growing influence that Farrakhan has on some of the most powerful Black leaders in America is an ominous sign. Louis Farrakhan delivers Jew-hating speeches in rooms with thousands of loyal followers and, his, and has done so for decades. Again, some of his followers, admirers, and associates are among the most prominent Black men and women in America. These men and women include entertainers and rappers, politicians, congressional lawmakers, professional athletes, and well-funded activists. Again, told you we're going to have to do some serious work here tonight. In far too many public schools going on, dealing with this as education. Across the US, students are not receiving the type of authentic education necessary to make them critical thinkers or informed citizens. What's more, some school districts are beginning to adopt a curriculum that is blatantly anti-Semitic, starting with the college level. I cite my former home state for nearly all of my life. In August 2020, Gav Governor Gavin Newsom uh, signed into law, the critical ethnic studies program for the California State University CSU system. This curriculum is part of a of bill AB 1460. And this is a quote from an article about the bill. Spearheaded by AMCHA initiative, 90 education, civil rights and religious groups had called on Newsom to veto the bill AB 1460. Continuing the quote, the groups noted that vetoing AB 1460 was necessary because of anti-Zionist advocacy and the promotion of BDS are intrinsic part of critical ethnic studies. Critical ethnic studies faculty have repeatedly demonstrated a willingness to promote BDS and anti-Zionist advocacy in their academic programming and classrooms and faculty support and promotion of BDS are linked to the harassment of Jewish students. Continuing on the quote from the book, according to California's Department of Education's 2017 statistics, 75% of black boys cannot read at grade level. They are functionally illiterate. This level of illiteracy is a scale not seen since the end of the Civil War and the evidence of the most pressing yet most neglected civil rights issue of our day. This problem of epic proportions must be addressed at home and in the school. Not only are there at three out, are three out of four black boys in California's public schools unable to read and write proficiently, soon they may be taught anti-Zionist propaganda so they can blame Israel and the Jews for their lot in life. This is something a colleague of mine calls the Palestinization of the black community. Just as Palestinian children in Gaza are taught to hate Jews, so will be the effect of California's critical ethnic studies on California's students. This is just an example of one of the groups that is fighting for an ethnic studies curriculum. And let me say this, some of you are aware of this fight that's going on in California. My son, Joshua has represented Ipsy, has spoken on several panels virtually that have come against this, not only in how anti-Zionist it is, but how it distorts uh, black history as well. There's no uh, favorable mention of people like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. They're considered weak, they're considered passive but there's a glorification of, of a more violent mindset, not to mention, not even mention the people like Thurgood Marshall and Booker T. Washington and Frederick Douglass. This is unfortunately what's happening and what has to be fought. And this, crap, this screen grab that you see is actually from one of the groups that's attempting to pass this uh, critical ethnic studies, the first draft of it, meaning even the ones that have been improved upon, they are now not only pushing the first draft, but they are introducing it to school districts across, across California, and many of them are accepting. As of about a month ago, 20 different school districts have accepted the first pro-BDS anti-Israel draft. These human rights organizations legitimately are concerned about improving the quality of Black lives. Why are they a mouthpiece for Palestinian terrorism against Israel? How does their anti-Zionist ideology help Black people? For that matter, how does it help the Palestinians? 
this is my central point before I move on from this, that if it's any organization or person that is concerned about helping the black community in whatever area, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's education, whether it's business, whatever, whatever area in which there's maybe a struggle, if that is the purported goal, what good does anti-Zionism and anti-Israel ideology do in that effort? The answer to that rhetorical question, ladies and gentlemen, is nothing. Not only does it do nothing good, it's only hindering. It's not helping the group. It's not helping Black Americans. It's not helping anyone in America. And it's certainly not helping the Palestinians. Whenever we see that type of mixing of issues, we should always call into serious question the motives of those people or those organizations who are behaving in this way. Let's look at the light. Chapter six, we deal with kind of why we're all here. How do we move forward? Well, we have a suggestion. I, I lay it out in my book and my son is executing uh, a vision for moving forward that's rooted in solid principles and we believe will have a major impact on this discussion. Quote from chapter six, there were three essential elements to the rise of the black American family after centuries of slavery, faith in God, education and entrepreneurialism. Now as a pastor, I can do the faith in God thing for the next hour and everything. So we're not going to do that in the interest of time, but I do want to turn your attention to the education and the entrepreneurialism. Pause, let me say this. I am in no way dismissing faith. Again, it was black people's faith, whether it was the Negro spirituals, which I talk about in chapters one and chapter two, it was our belief that God would deliver there was so much identification in our lot as slaves with the Israelites of the Bible that the greatest abolitionist of her time, uh, Harriet Tubman, we called her Moses. This is how much of an identity, if you know anything about the Negro spirituals, most of them set, even in the Old Testament, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. And those songs weren't just sung in terms of uh, the, the Bible characters and glorifying the story and, and, and also uh, 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 connecting to what was actually a, a story of, of slavery to freedom. They were also coded songs. They were giving information about how they were going to meet and steal away home, which was another song. They were songs in which they spoke to each other in code about escaping the slave plantation. Education was how black families took their place in a society not necessarily established to see them succeed. According to economist Dr. Thomas Sowell, quote, as blacks emerged from slavery, a minute percentage could read or write. And yet in half a century, over half the black population was literate. Economic historians call that one of the most remarkable things in history. And the black folk who knew would tell you that it was God. If it had not been for the Lord on our side, just like David wrote that song, we sung it and applied it to our situation. You had blacks emerging from slavery in a way that had not been done. It was unprecedented. One of the ways that happened, ladies and gentlemen, was the synergy of Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington, Jewish philanthropist of Sears Roebuck fame, Julius Rosenwald, an educator and author again, Booker T. Washington, one who wasn't so much the founder of Tuskegee, but he revitalized the Tuskegee Institute. Quote, a key component in educating the post-slavery population was the collaborative work of Booker T. Washington and Jewish philanthropist Julius Rosenwald beginning in 1912. Though Washington died just three years later in 1915, the venture he started with Rosenwald ultimately produced over 5,000 schools for black children throughout the Jim Crow South, Rosenwald schools. Julius Rosenwald also provided fellowship grants for black students to further their education beyond high school. Rosenwald fellows included some of the most iconic black figures in American history. Writer Langston Hughes, opera singer Marian Anderson, author and activist James Baldwin, artist Lawrence Jacobs, photographer Gordon Parks, Jr. Dr. Charles Drew, Dunbar High School graduate physician who revolutionized ways to process and store blood plasma, and poet Maya Angelou were all Rosenwald fellows.
a synergy, ladies and gentlemen, a generation before we even get to a Dr. King and Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel. This connection with the Black and Jewish community in the United States post-slavery, right there at the turn of the 19th of the 20th century, we see it has a shape of the entire nation helping to educate an entire community of Blacks who had been formerly slaves and these now their descendants who are recipients of a Jewish man's philanthropy. Continuing a quote, Julius Rosenwald's rabbi, MLG Hirsch, was one of the Jewish founders of the NAACP and encouraged Rosenwald's efforts on behalf of the Black community. As Rosenwald stated, quote, whether it is because I belong to a people who have known centuries of persecution or whether it is because I am naturally inclined to sympathize with the oppressed, I have always felt keenly for the colored race. It is amazing that Rosenwald's words supporting Black people echoed those of Zionist founding father, Theodore Herzl, who my daughter-in-law, I believe, quoted even on last night. This echoes back to chapter five, but it's still on education as we turn this corner. Among the countless examples of the miseducation that would cause a Black child to choose an inferior status in its oft-abused topic, is the oft-abused topic of Tulsa's Black Wall Street. I wanna pause here and say, ladies and gentlemen, in the book, I talk about Black Wall Street, if you don't know about it, I discuss it there in the book, as a connection to not just in terms of the, the Black community past and present, but also in terms of this issue of Israel, this issue of Zionism, and you'd have to see this in the book, we'll do a little bit of it here. Generally speaking, Black young men and women know one of two things about the historic Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma. They either know one, nothing, or two, that white racists destroyed it in 1921. Tulsa's Black Wall Street, from the name Negro Wall Street, given by Booker T. Washington, was one of the many Black communities throughout Oklahoma and various parts of the nation. It was an economic powerhouse established wholly by Black families, business leaders, and entrepreneurs less than 50 years after slavery ended. These are pictures of the 1921 race massacre. Factories, theaters, oil rigs destroyed, but that's only half of the story. It is crucial to know the whole story of Tulsa's Greenwood District, like it is crucial to learn authentic history. Knowing that white racists destroyed it, killing an untold number of innocent Black men, women, and children is heart-wrenching. It's the stuff that fuels hatred and the desire for revenge. Knowing that the residents rebuilt Greenwood and made it more prosperous than ever and thrived until the 1960s infuses one with great pride. It speaks to the greatness of a people who, after centuries of slavery and while facing Jim Crow segregation and violence, accomplished the impossible twice. Taught manipulatively, the story of Tulsa's Black Wall Street is yet another example of white hatred and Black helplessness in America. Taught honestly, the story of Tulsa's Black Wall Street is a powerful, albeit painful, saga of resilience and strength. A history of tragedy and triumph is one of the many ties that bind the Black American and Jewish people. And Oklahoma is a unique space in terms of the number of African American towns that were established. Some suggest African American towns between 1924 and 1928. Reverend S.S. Jones was going around documenting this sort of self-determined, vibrant African-American communities. You see the African-American educators, doctors, lawyers, landowners, oil barons. And I think that's what's so remarkable about this footage to think that individuals, how many years out of slavery are now owned oil wells that are producing 2,000 barrels a day. Is that not the ultimate American dream? Is that not the ultimate American story? 
It flies in the face of what I think some people consider part of African American history and culture. I mean, I think that that was one of the things that Oklahoma and what S.S. Jones is really kind of showing is that that African American history and culture is not a monolith. And in a way, it became kind of like a marketing tool to encourage individuals to migrate, to move there, that this is a place where you can live, you can thrive, and peacefully reside. There were still palpable racial tensions. There are lynchings, there's Jim Crow segregation, there's all of these things, and you still have an African-American community or many communities that really speak to the fortitude and resilience of Black people in this country. I am not suggesting that Black Wall Street would not have taken place had Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington not come together. What I am saying, ladies and gentlemen, that that Black Jewish synergy helped pave the way. This is just a fact of history. So in order to bring these things to bear on where we are when it comes to Israel and the Black American community, we now discuss how we move forward. What you see before you, you may have seen in a couple of, of, of videos that have gone both before and after each of these events is what's called the Plan for Education, Advocacy and Community Engagement Peace. This is a Ipsy brainchild that my son Joshua is spearheading. And it's one of the ways, ladies and gentlemen, that you can help. I know you can't read all those texts here, I just blow it up for you. This is the plan the overview of it here. One of four things. Number one, Ipsy focuses its recruitment efforts on young, influential, and ascendant Black American and African men and, men and women between the ages of 22 and 40. Two, Ipsy's education effort is a holistic approach that will teach young African and Black Americans authentic Black history, including the Black church's deep identification with Israel and spiritual Zionism. Three, each participant will make a pilgrimage to the Holy Land and learning first, learning firsthand of Israel's cultural, religious, and ethnic diversity, its technological achievements, and its long-standing partnership with African states. Future expansion of the Israel tour will include a prior visit to an African nation. And then four Ipsy ambassadors will be a part of what's called Tesfa centers, something that Ipsy is coined. Tesfa is the Amharic word for hope and it is a connection to the ancient relationship between Israel and Africa when Queen Makeda from Ethiopia visited Solomon in King Solomon in Jerusalem. Part of Tesfa Center's group will serve as the headquarters for Black Jewish Africa Israel education and activity in the area. A bold plan ladies and gentlemen that Ipsy is excited about because we believe it will be effective. So how can you help? I'm so glad you asked that question. I can just kind of feel you coming through the airwaves there. Three basic ways. Number one, become a monthly donor to Ipsy. Ipsy is a nonprofit and we can, uh, you can uh, tax deductible, your gifts are tax deductible. Um, and we will um, be more than uh, appreciative of your gift of whatever amount. Number two, purchase Zionism in the black church. Um, a portion of the proceeds goes to Ipsy. And again, I'll say again, humbly, but don't claim to have all the answers, but the book uh, does a historical perspective. And then in chapter six lays out how we move forward. And then lastly, subscribe to Ipsy's emailing list and follow on social media. It will be our primary way of contacting and updating you, everything from the book to other events. And yes, even with the peace program, we are hopeful that the program will start later on this year and that we will begin to recruit uh, young Black American and African young people here in the States in several different uh, city locales, right? different places that we're looking at to have a concentrated group we believe and are excited about this prospect. My son, again, he's spearheading it. He's doing legwork. We, myself, I'm an advisor, as well as Reverend Kenneth Mishwe. Many of you know Olga's father. He is a parliament member in South Africa, strong Israel advocate. And we have the privilege of not just seeing our young people do amazing things, but 
helping to advise them and help as much as we possibly can. I wanna thank you so much for coming here on tonight. I hope this was helpful. I'm gonna give it to Maria now for our Q&A. All right, everyone. Now we have arrived once again at the Q&A portion of tonight's discussion. Um, so if you haven't already, please type your questions in the chat or you can use the reaction function at the bottom of your screen to raise your hand and I'll call on you one by one to unmute your microphones. If you're on your phone, then it's the three little dots in the corner instead of the reaction function. Um, I'm gonna start with what's in the chat. I saw one question already. Um, this is from Huge Greenstein um, and he asks, would you please comment on the other black Jewish groups in, the Afri in Africa in addition to the Ethiopian Jews? Oh, absolutely. So um, it's funny that, um, uh, and it's powerful as well, that um, it is the Ethiopian Israelis that are probably the most well known for anyone who knows about African Jews that are living in Israel. But we also know that there's a small uh, Igbo Jewish community that lives in mostly in Tel Aviv. Some of you don't know the Igbo. Igbo are a Jewish group that claims their ancestry after the, the destruction of the Northern Kingdom during the Syrian invasion of 722. Um, that group of Igbo that from West Africa that live in Tel Aviv, they actually, some of you may or may not be aware of this, the Biafra Wars in Nigeria of the late 1960s, 1970s, in which uh, the Nigerian government was responsible for some 3 million deaths. It was a genocide of the Igbo in the, in the Biafra region. Sadly, we see those things happening again. There's a Christian and Igbo genocide happening in, in Nigeria right now as we sit. Okay? Uh, the only, one of the only nations that helped the Igbo of Nigeria was Israel. Israeli pilots flew relief missions, very dangerous relief missions, dropping off medicine and food there. And when the war was over, some of those Igbo came and moved to Israel and they live there, many of them in the Tel Aviv area today. So are the Igbo that are there. Uh, there are those others that are, there are uh, formerly black American uh, uh, Jewish people who live, uh, live in Israel now who made Aliyah, they converted to Judaism, uh, they went through the process, they live there now. That has been happening for a long period of time. It's not talked about very much. There's another group that's there that first moved there in the late 1960s called the Black Hebrew Israelites. And it's a loaded term because that term, it, has, it refers to lots of different groups, including unfortunately one in the United States or some in the United States that have a very, very negative anti-Israel stance. Okay, this is a separate one from the ones who moved there in Israel. They, they uh, live in what's called a, almost like a community of peace. Uh, they have been integrated into Israeli society. They serve in the IDF. So yes, there are Jews of African descent who are not just the Ethiopian Jews, Beta Israel. Uh, we have such a storied past, but absolutely, uh, we are aware of many of the African Jewish uh, communities that do live in Israel. Awesome, thank you. Um, next, we have a question from Amy Rosenthal, um, and just why do you think, or why is the illiteracy rate so high? The illiteracy rate, I believe that's what it was, yeah? Yes, why is there such a high illiteracy rate? I, I, I even mentioned this in my book. So when you're talking about something like this, first of all, for those of you who are aware, and this could be a touchy subject, but within throughout, uh, not just California's, but the public school systems in certain places, and please, those of you who are teachers, I'm a teacher as well, my, my wife's a teacher. This is not a denigration on teachers, right? It's not what I'm, I'm talking about. Unfortunately, in the United States, those of you aware of the state of education, the illiteracy rates are high, not just in the Black American community, but in others as well, some others as well. Unfortunately, when you have a combination of some, whether it's poverty, whether it's high crime and other mitigating factors, those things also contribute to what would be the child not learning at a pace that he or she should be learning both at home and in school, okay? Uh, so the, the high literacy rate, it's even higher in Baltimore, right? I believe there's some stat, I can't pull it up here now, but they, they polled something like 12, 13 different public schools and could not find a student who was proficient in math or in reading. This is a tragedy in the United States of America, right? It just unfortunately disproportionately affects the African-American community, but it is affecting other communities. So the answer to the question, why is it so high? There's lots of different reasons why that is. It's family, it's community, it's all of those things. One of the reasons why I actually bring it up in my book and even in this presentation is that when you're talking about combating anti-Zionist ideology, for example, when you take the tragedy of a high 
uh, uh, illiteracy rate, particularly from a people who we have always valued education. And as I shared with you, the Thomas Sowell quote had actually moved in literacy faster than had even been seen in terms of economic historians. When you take a, a liter illiteracy rate and then you inject now into the curriculum anti-Zionism, which not only is not helping the child not to read and do reading comprehension, but is only filling him or her with hatred, you have a time bomb on your head. Ipsy is waving the flag to the nation saying, this is not tenable, this cannot stand. And we are in our own way, as much as we can with God's help, as my Jewish friends say, Yasha Koat, you can say that to us right there, I can hear right there. We want to be able to move this forward and actually begin to take Black Americans and begin to walk through this issue in terms of all the education that we feel that is most important, taking those bright, very capable young ones to Israel and then bringing them back and, and being placed with throughout their community. So there are many different reasons why that's so high. That, that, that'd be a whole nother Zoom session all on its own. I hope I touched on some of them. Yes, thank you. Next, the question from Liz Wagner reads, well, many people have told her uh, there is no reason for concern about people like Farrakhan and Mark Lamont Hill because most black Americans don't listen to them, but her gut tells her um, that we need to call out all anti-Jewish and anti-Israel hate speech. What is your view? Your gut is right. You, you now, you're both right on both counts. Yes, the, the Louis Farrakhan's and his acolytes do not speak for the majority of the black American community. Make that very, very clear. They do not. Unfortunately, and I make this clear in my book, they have such a broad platform and loud bullhorn. I, for my Jewish friends that are on the call here, it would be like uh, some of them, I'm not gonna even name names still, marginal Jewish groups that are very, very anti-Israel. And you and I both know, whether you're on the left or right side of the aisle, they do not speak for the vast majority of the Jewish community. Unfortunately, they often have a broad platform. Well, this is true in the Black community. Farrakhan does not speak for the majority of the Black American community, but he has influence, unfortunately, in, in places of power. This is why we actually talk about it in the book. It's difficult to talk about because it's not a happy subject, right? But the, the problem is that at some point, in terms of dealing with the situation, you have to actually call it what it is. So yes, and to your last point, uh, ma'am, I can't remember the name of the person who asked the question. Yes, we do have to call it out. Um, I'll, I'll say this, um, many of you know that for years now, for years, the whether you wanna call it the Haredi or the Orthodox Jewish community in certain neighborhoods of New York have been living under terror. There have been attacks, there have been violence, and it happens on a virtually regular basis. The only reason I know is because I have relationships with some of those communities and some of the other publications like Yeshiva World News reports it. It goes virtually unreported. And having relationships with some of those communities, many of those Jewish men and women are afraid. Why doesn't it get talked about? Well, once again, I have to kind of slay one of those sacred cows because the people attacking them, it's politically incorrect to say who's attacking them. And unfortunately, it's often, often Black Americans, Latino, and sometimes Arab. Sometimes it's dismissed. I, I, I even recognized several months ago, the mayor of New York said it was white supremacist. No, I mean, I'm not saying white supremacy is not a thing, but if you call it what it's not, how do you actually combat it? This is what we have to do. In speaking truth to power, you sometimes have to say uncomfortable things in order to truly move forward. So that's another thing, again, being able to, to call something what it is and then be able to rectify what's going on. All right, I believe this will be our last question for the evening. So I'll ask this one because it kind of encompasses the ones that are also remaining. Um, what is Ipsy's strategy for educating the Black churches and I'll also add the Black community about Jews in Israel? Well, the strategy is already in place. Um, we work with, uh, and my son has been doing this at my side. He was doing it before, but he's doing spearheading it now. Uh, black pastors. Black youth pastors, uh, church leaders, um, having events, giving information. Um, just uh, uh, my primary role in terms of advocacy, again, is uh, I'm, I'm uh, mostly uh, my role with uh, Christians United for Israel, and I, which I enjoy, I love to do. Um, I get calls virtually every week from Black pastors 
across the country wanting to talk about something like the Black Hebrew Israelites and their anti-Semitism, right? And what they're seeing and hearing, wanting to understand. There are Black pastors across the country who are engaged, who see some of what's happening and want to know how best to approach it, whether they see something in their congregation, in their community. IPSI stands at the ready. Our primary focus, ladies and gentlemen, is education, which is one of the reasons why in my book, I focus on that particularly in chapters five and, and especially in chapter six, because it is the key, just as it was the key to the black American community moving from post-slavery America to even a certain amount of wealth and affluence through the 20s, the 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up to the 60s when you had those black Wall Streets in different parts of the country. And I'm not in any way doing a pie in the sky. There was all kinds of problems. There was still racism, as you saw in that video. There were lynchings. There, I'll, I'll end it by saying this. One of the things that has always inspired the black community about our Jewish brothers and sisters is that you as a people have known persecution. You've known dispossession, thousands of years of it. Yet this Zionist dream, this moving forward is something even during on the plantations as slaves are singing about Moses and about Israel and about God's deliverance, it has God's deliverance. It has always been something of a inspiration. People like, um, oh boy, I'm gonna, I'm doing this on the fly. Um, Black Zionism, uh, boy, it's escaping me. Um, oh, just that quick, I, my brain is doing that thing. I have two grandchildren now, so you have to forgive me. I was, I have six kids, but after two grandkids, it's gone. Um, uh, can you think? So you had different black leaders who would reference Zionism, right? Would reference Israel as an inspiration. People, for example, like Malcolm X, who was no Zionist, he even was quoted as saying that it will do for the black community what Zion, Zionism, what, what it did for the Jewish community, it will do that for the black community. W.B. Du Bois talked about it being a rallying cry. We're gonna look at what the Jews are doing, how they're doing it, it du during Du Bois' time. Israel has not yet been reborn, but the Zionist ideology was alive and well. There were black leaders being inspired by that. This has always been the case, and it will continue to be uh, the case moving forward. We're excited about what the future actually holds. We see it's a huge challenge, but it's okay. We, we, want to, we want to match that challenge, and we believe that we'll be able to, and with your help, I believe we're going to be able to see a turning of the tide. So is that it, Maria? I'll keep talking. I'm a pastor, so we can keep talking about that. <laughs> Um, that can be our last question, unless you wanted to do one more. Um. I, I'll spare the people now. I just I <laughs> thank everyone for coming. I really do. Uh, and then you'll be looking for my son. He'll be doing a lot of other work here in the very near future. Join our emailing list and I'll give it to you, Marie.
Thank you.